thank you everyone for coming to this Black Belt session. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce you to two of my colleagues at Docker here, Tonis and uh, Ian. Uh, they're going to talk about supercharged uh, Docker build with BuildKit. So Tonis uh, is a maintainer on Docker Engine, and he also created the BuildKit project. So he's going to talk about that. And Ian, uh, who works from the Cambridge office, um, he created Docker Assemble that you saw earlier in the keynote today. So um, he, for the record, he also ported Xen to ARM, which is not a small feat. So please uh, welcome, with a warm welcome, Tonis and Ian. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. So today, we're going to discuss uh, Docker build and Docker files. So your developers in here, most of you probably, who already should be quite used to those tools, use them all the time because they're a very important part of our platform. So today, we're going to show you some of the new capabilities, new features, how to get most out of your build. And then we're going to so show you uh, completely new support for custom languages in Docker build that all the developers can take advantage of. So we got a lot to cover. Let's get started. Uh, we have a new release, 1809. Uh, hope a lot of you have already upgraded to it. The part that we're interested about this today is that 1809 is the first release with BuildKit support enabled for Docker build. So uh, everything you'll see here today, you can start to use it right away. You can uh, just get the latest Docker. Uh, if you have not heard about BuildKit yet, then just a quick introduction. It's this uh, new uh, builder toolkit that we've uh, created under Mobi organization. Totally open source, has a ton of new capabilities. So you can use it in standalone, some tools, wrap it, uh, or, or try to use it like this. And now we're integrating it straight back to the Docker build so that because we want all the Docker developers to take advantage of all those cool new features. Um, in 18.09, BuildKit is uh, opt-in. You need to enable it to start to use it. The way you do it is you set this environment variable, or if you don't want to set it all the time, you can just uh, enable it in the, in the daemon config as well. Uh, once you do that, after you run your regular Docker build again, you will notice this new uh, new UI when, when you're running inside terminal allows you to get a better overview of your build and, and, and verify that it's actually building with BuildKit. So let's do some comparisons compared to the old builder and, uh, and BuildKit and show you why you would want to definitely switch over today. So if you look at the old builder or like look at, uh, took an outline of a Docker file and what the old builder is doing with it, then what's happening is that we're just reading all the commands in our Docker files from the start to the end, one by one, until we, until we have reached uh, to the final command. So if you compare this to BuildKit, then first thing you'll notice is that the arrow is the other way. So we will actually start from the build result that you're, you want to achieve as a result of your build, and then we walk our way back and see what are the actual dependencies that are required for this build. So by doing this, we can see that some commands don't require containers. We can see that uh, there can be stages that are not needed, for, needed to be built at all for this specific build, and we can just skip them. So this allows you to add uh, many more multi-stage pattern to your build workflow, like you could add uh, test st stages, you could add some kind of helper stages, and they will not interact or like interfere with your with your uh, main build flow at all, you could still have good performance there. Uh, another thing that we can do is that if you discover that your two stages do not depend on each other, we can just build them in parallel. So this gives you much better performance. Um, so this is uh, why BuildKit is, uh, is making much more decisions and is much faster in the end. So one other example, is what's happening with your local resources in the old builder. 
uh, what we do is we make a giant tarball of all your local files even before your build starts and we ship it to the daemon. As you might expect, it's not like a super fast process. Uh, in, if you compare it to build kit, we still do the build request, but we don't waste time compressing your files and, and, and sending them all, all to the daemon. Instead, we open up a new request that we call session and now we allow daemon to do smart decisions. For example, it may want to read a Docker file. Uh, we can analyze the Docker file, see what files you actually use, and only transfer those files, not, not the ones that you don't need. And if you're doing like a second build, we already know that the files you transferred earlier, well, so we only do like an rsync type style, uh, style up, update of your files. So that's like super fast compared to the old one and much more efficient. So it definitely will save you a lot of time. Some other uh, quick like things that you will notice different is uh, we have a, a completely new storage model. So we don't create hundreds of images anymore that, that you need to manage on your own just for holding build cache. So build cache is now uh, as a separate line in, in the storage management. And we have a special new command if you want to clean up your build cache, Docker Builder Prune. And you can use it for a bit like smart filters so that you could say, for example, that you only want to clean up cache that has not been used for some period of time, or you can set uh, a storage limit. And then we will use like the internal statistics of, of BuildKit to figure out what, what cache uh, records have less priority and only clean up those until we, we match the storage limit. And there's an even, even like an optional garbage collection that will do this automatically and make sure you never run out of this space. So these were some uh, overall builder features. features. Uh, let's look at uh, what about Docker files. So of course, as you might expect, we want to build Docker files and build it, can build Docker files and is compatible with all your old Docker files. So the upgrade should be super smooth. There shouldn't be any, any problem with that. But there is actually so much more in there. So if you look at what the build kit actually does with your build definition is that there are two methods of how build kit can receive the build definition. There's something called LLB and there are front ends. So the LLB is the actual main build definition format that uh, build kit uses internally. It's a very low level, it's a binary DAG. It's only meant for really like implementers who want to wrap uh, or like create tools around that. And this is the part that does like the heavy lifting that finds the most efficient build path, make sure things are parallelized and also make sure that things are cached so that if your next build has some shared components, then we don't rebuild unnecessarily. Uh, if you compare this to frontends, then frontend is a component that, that takes an uh, user language, like user, user defined format and converts it to LLB, basically wraps around the LLB model. Uh, what's cool about frontends is that they are distributable as regular Docker images. So you can just create the frontend, push it to a registry, and start to use it right away as your custom language in, in Docker build. And all of our Docker file support is completely implemented inside this frontend. Uh, the regular build kit like, knows almost nothing about it. Uh, we also have, uh, like a proof of concept uh, support for build packs. You could build a build pack uh, uh, directly, uh, um, directly with Docker build without any need for the Docker file at all. It will give you an, an image pack. And as Tibor mentioned, there's, uh, and you should have seen yesterday in the keynote, there's this new tool, Docker Assemble, that can uh, like uh, analyze your, uh, your .NET or, uh, or Java application and build it efficiently uh, without any Docker files. And that's using all the same technologies and all the same concepts as well. It's implemented uh, the same way uh, basically as our Docker file support. So this front end concept, it allows us to expand the scope of, of uh, the build definition. It uh, allows us to add new languages. It also helps us to add new features to Docker file frontend itself because it's much more easier now. It can be, we can add it, we can, we can uh, build that new version of frontend and just use it externally. So we've started with that already. I'll give you some 
examples of what we have done. And all the examples I will show are using very similar syntax. What we have done is we've taken this run command in Dockerfile and we've added uh, dashes mount flag to the run command. And with this uh, flag, you can expose new file system or files uh, in certain mount points that are available to this, uh, this process only that's executing as part of this run command. So let's take a look at like how we would uh, actually use this. So as a basic example of, of a mount, let's look at this Docker file. And it's a simple Docker file, just copies and tars up some files. Uh, but if you look at it more deeply, it has some, some issues there. Uh, for example, this copy in here, like we don't really need to do this copy because we don't care about those files. We only use it for this one run command. And we try to remove it, but if you know how layers work in Docker files or, or in Docker generally, then you would know that this RM actually does nothing. It basically just like, it's like uh, switches metadata over. Uh, to do the same thing with, uh, with run dashes mount is we can just replace the whole thing with a single line and mount the build context directly on a specific path so that uh, tar can access tar process in here can access files from this uh, from this path and but it doesn't pollute your image and it also doesn't put doesn't uh, like duplicate your build cache so it everything remains very efficient so this is definitely like something that we wouldn't expect you to just go around the docker files and exp and replace all your copy commands with this it's uh, but if you want to get like uh, a very good performance uh, out of it and and uh, for some cases it can be like super super beneficial uh, another very similar example is uh, something that users have been asking for us for a very very long time and that's uh, support for build time secrets so please n nobody please do this so don't uh, don't do this and don't use environment variables and, and uh, things like that. They're not secure at all. So how do we make this secure um, and, uh, and expose uh, secrets securely? What you can do is uh, you can use a mount again with a type uh, secret. And this is a special type of mount. We, uh, we mount it only on TempFS. We make sure that we don't leak any data that this uh, mount is providing to, to any of the build cache or, any, or to the image metadata. We're basically protecting this mount very heavily. And to actually connect this, uh, this secret with an actual value, you can just pass it from the, from the client side with a new flag uh, that's the secret. So let's look at like something, how you would actually, how we would actually use it. And let's just do an example of for example, how we would access an S3 bucket. Uh, so in here, I have a Docker file that's accessing an S3 bucket. It's not really that hard in, in, in Docker files. I just install AWS CLI and then run, run the CP command. And for demo purposes, I'm just like carrying out uh, the file that I, that I pulled. So if I now build this Docker build, uh, We'll see that it's doing this AWS CP and it failed. Uh, but it, why it failed is that this uh, S3 bucket that we are copying out of from is private and you can only access it with certain credentials. So obviously, uh, Docker file by default can't do that. So, but what we can do is we can do the, the mount type secret. So let's do that. Let's uh, go back to this run command. At, uh, at a mount in here, type secret. Um, for ID, we can just name it AWS. And for target, I know that the AWS uh, expects credentials from, from this uh, path in here. So let's save it. Let's go back to this window and, and rebuild it. Uh, it still failed, but as you see, the error message is now different. Now the builder is telling us that that to, in order to build this Docker file, you need to pass a secret named AWS. So let's do that. Let's do the uh, Docker build as the secret uh, ID. We named it AWS and just pass the file. And when we're doing this now, we're reaching the same, same command again. And as you see, 
it, it passed and it had no problem of, of accessing this private value. And just to show you but run the command and this was the file that we that we securely pulled from from private uh, private bucket during the build uh, we now without worrying at all that we could do any information leakage so for a next one let's look at uh, another example of of uh, how how you could do secure or private access private uh, resources from a build and that's uh, the case that most people are interested in when they talk about build secrets and that's like how you could access your private source repositories so you could use build secrets for for this one as well but there's some some uh, issues like you you're not really supposed to ever expose your ssh private keys and maybe you have passphrases on them and and there and uh, in the end there is a built-in way already in ssh how you can pass the, the authentication uh, between systems, and that's uh, that's how the agent, SSH agent for running works. So we've just added this support directly in Docker build as well. So if you use uh, that's just mount with type SSH, what we would mount is a socket where all your programs that use SSH would automatically connect, and uh, and uh, and we will make sure that this SSH agent has, uh, has capabilities that can be passed from the client. So in, in this case, we're passing uh, like the default, uh, we're passing our current uh, SSH agent under the default namespace. And just like a very quick example, uh, I have a Docker file in here, just doing a git clone of a repository. And, and if I do the build of that, then it's doing the git clone and it, it's failing because it's a private repository. But as soon as I add mount type uh, SSH to this, uh, to this line in here, let's say this, move back and then do, then pass our, my own uh, SSH agent in here. Then it's doing the git clone and and it's doing the git clone, and it's uh, and it passed right away. So it's uh, uh, so it's uh, like super easy to access uh, private repositories now, like your, and and build them as part of your regular Docker file build flow. And you don't need to do any key management even because all the all the commands will just pick this uh, socket up automatically. And the uh, final example I want to show you about the mounts is something called the uh, cache mount. So this really allows you to get the uh, next level performance out of your builds. What, uh, what the cache mount does is it gives you a writable location where your application can write something. And if you're doing a, a next uh, build, then we will connect the same data back to the, uh, back to the, with the same process. So, for example, lots of applications can do their own caching, lots of compilers, lots of package managers, and they can just uh, start to get, take advantage of it. For example, this example in here is using a Go feature, so Go would use cache from, from this location. So as a very quick example in here, I have, a, I have connected to two machines that have the same hardware. Uh, they are, uh, I've checked out uh, an actual project in both of them uh, it's, the, it's actually a build kit project itself, and I've only made one change between those machines. It's uh, that when it's building those binaries, the right one is using a cache mount, and the left one is not. So that's the only change between those two projects. So and if you try to build this one in both of them, then you will see that it's like super fast in both of them. But uh, okay, that's maybe a good demo, but. Uh, but that's not really what's happening on, on, on real life. Like in real life, like how, how many times you, you build the same stuff over and over again. Uh, what's really hap what happening in real life is that you're going to make some kind of modification in your source code. And then it's really important, like how much time it takes to rebuild after the source code change. So I'm just forcing a source code change in here, just writing a date in, in one of the source files. And that should definitely cause the, the binaries to be rebuilt. 
So I did that, and now when I do the build again, you'll notice that they start again very similarly. They, but now the right one is progressing way faster, and the right one is completed. I can just do like another change in here, build the right one again, and the left one is still going on. So the left one still has all the built kit, the other optimization, it's just the cache mount. Uh, like if I would compare it to the old builder, like we couldn't wait for it to complete. So, so, so yeah, like as you can see, like I, I could make, I had plenty of time to make two builds with the right one at the same time that the left one was running. So this will, if you're using this in a developer workflow, this will like definitely be a, like a super impactful change. Um, I talked about this, uh, this uh, way how we can uh, do front ends externally now, and uh, the way you would uh, use an external front end now in Docker build is that uh, in the first line of the Docker file you need to define the syntax, uh, the syntax comment or syntax directive, and if we find the syntax directive in your Docker file, what we will do is we would actually pull this image and use this as a builder. So we have some Docker file images available. Uh, the official ones that you can use externally like this. We have them in two channels. One is the stable channel, the experimental is the other one. Uh, the stable channel is basically the same implementation that you get built in as well. The difference is that we can release you box fixes without uh, requiring you to upgrade the daemon or, or wait for a daemon upgrade. Uh, it uses semantic versioning, so you have the backwards compatibility guarantees. Uh, in experimental channel, we can Play, uh, play around, try out new features, uh, like uh, see what people like, and eventually, like best of those features should graduate to the stable channel. So all the mounts uh, are currently in the experimental channel. So to use them, you would need to use uh, one of those in the, as a syntax directive in the beginning of the Docker file. So this was Docker files, but uh, uh, all of this capability of how this Docker file and frontends were built is exposed to all of you, so Ian's gonna talk about how you will take it to the next level and actually build a custom front end. Thank you, so thank you, Thomas. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna uh, lay a little bit of groundwork, a little bit of the concepts that are needed for writing a custom front end, uh, and then I'm actually gonna go ahead and write one here on stage. Um, so, one of the things I'm gonna do as part of this is I'm gonna be targeting the, the BuildKit uh, API directly. Um, so BuildKit has a few features that aren't yet surfaced via Docker build, um, nested builds and various cache import and export options. Uh, but importantly, from my point of view, it, it has uh, two different ways of launching a front end. So it has API methods called build and solve. And both of them accept a front end and uh, key value pairs as arguments for that front end. Um, but build takes the front end as a function, and so it'll run on the client side, whereas solve takes a container image reference to run. Uh, so build is quite convenient for development purposes. You can iterate quite quickly just by rebuilding, rebuilding your front end client, whereas solve is uh, better once you come to actually deploy it into the real world and you want to uh, you know, run it on your existing cluster. Um, both of those uh, methods also take an exporter and some arguments for that, uh, and so what happens is at the front end, uh, produces a result and that's then passed to the exporter and the exporter, ha you know, there are different exporters. There's ones for OCI images, Docker images, save to the local directory, uh, save to a tarball, all, all sorts of things. Um, all right, so let's have a little look at the internal flow. Um, so we have a client at the top, it talks over gRPC to the BuildKit daemon um, and it talks to the controller. Um, and within BuildKit there is also the solver which is the real brains, the real engine that does all of, all of the actual work and its main interface is LLB the uh, low-level binary DAG that Thomas mentioned. So if a client calls build, it calls control with that, uh, and what that causes to happen, it causes a gateway API to be instantiated on, on the public gRPC interface. Um, and this is the set of, this is a gRPC interface that is accessible to the front ends. It's the way the front end gets to do its, gets to do its stuff. So having done that, when the client's called build, it would then launch its front end on the client side. The, client, uh, the, the front end functionality would then use all of these gateway methods, which the gateway then forwards through to the solver as, as LLB. Uh, it, the solver figures out what it needs to do, you know, evaluates whether things are cached, and if it needs to do anything, it'll call out to either run C or container D to uh, actually run a container and, and perform a build step. On the other hand, if you use the solve method, 
you still you call into the client calls into the controller, and it still creates a gateway API, but that's not publicly accessible. Um, so the controller will instead instantiate your front end image as a container within the, the, the server side. So that's how come you don't need to update things. You can just pull a container image and run it, run it on the server side. So a custom front end, as I say, it's passed some arguments from the client. There's some, uh, you know, some strings as key value pairs. Um, plus, it gets a handle onto this gateway gRPC API. Um, and the front end is expected to produce a result. And a result needs to contain one or more references to snapshots. So those are basically file system trees that you want to become a, a container. And there's some associated metadata. We'll look in some more depth in the result later on. Right, so one of the main things you need to do as a front end is you need to produce some LLB. Um, and LLB is a, a binary uh, DAG format. Um, so there is a client API which helps you by providing uh, Go level objects for constructing these DAGs. And the two main things that you have here are you have uh, source and run operations. And you can chain those together. Uh, in order to produce an output state, and a state is basically a request to the to the solver to 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 run this DAG, and this is the output file system state that I would like. Um, so, sources. There are many different types of sources. Um, one obvious one is an image. So, if you want to start from some existing container image, you can pull that from from a hub or a DTR. Uh, like you can pull the Alpine one. Um, Similarly, though, you could say, I want to start from a Git repo, and this would then uh, clone and present that Git repo as a source for use further down in the DAG. There's, there's loads. There's HTTP if you want to pack a tarball. There's Scratch if you just want an empty source. Um, and there's Locals, and Locals are the interesting ones. These are the ones that run, uh, so when Tonis was talking about the session and the context and being able to run uh, pull files from the client, basically that's a named local that the client exposes and it runs a, a file syncing protocol. And so that's how those get accessed from the LLB. So that's sources. Sources are basically inherently states. They already describe a file system uh, state that you want. The other uh, interesting operation is run. And so run needs to run on top of an existing state. So it's a method that you call on that. And it's, it's option. It's the variations there that are interesting are passed as options. So the main one, the most interesting and useful one, I guess, is the args. So this is how you would say, please run make, please run maven, please run a shell with this. Uh, scripting snippet. Um, another interesting thing you do is you can add amounts. If you have a, a, another state that you need to expose into the running environment for this particular run, then you can mount, say, a source state onto slash source. Um, and since these running containers, there's a whole bunch of other options to set the current directory, set the current user, secrets, networking, all that kind of thing. Now, a run is not in itself a state. Uh, we call it an, an exec op. So in order to then continue chaining in the DAG, you need a way to get a state out of a run. So kind of the most obvious way is if you want the, the root file system, the, 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 the result of running that, whatever command, if you run an APK install or something, then you want, you want that as your output. And that's, that's conceptually quite a simple one. The one that I have trouble getting my head around and trouble explaining to people is uh, if you do an add mount on the run, so not as an argument to run, but as a, as a, a method called on the result, um, what this does is this takes an input state, it'll mount it onto that run, but then the result is that input state as modified by the run. So it's not the root file system of the run, it's some third thing that flows through. And that's useful if you want to have help utilities that copy things around or move files and things where you maybe use BusyBox as your, uh, as your copy helper, but you, you, you just want your input state modified, not with BusyBox in it, potentially. Right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what the Gateway API offers. The main method that it offers you is the, a solve method, very similar to the control level solve. There's some subtle differences, but basically it's the same thing. Um, it's the main me mechanism by which a front end can get hold of references. So uh, a, gateway, a front end needs to return references and needs to get them from somewhere. So by using solve, it passes in an LLB graph describing the state at once. The solver will go away, figure that out, give you back a reference to that snapshot that you can then return to your core. Um, the result is much like the top level result references to snapshots, and accompanying metadata. So like I say, the main use for a reference is that you want to use it to construct the result from your front end. But you can also call some methods on it. Uh, so there's read file, stat file, lister. So that's if you've, you've done some building, you've, you've solved a state, and you've got a snapshot, and you want to read a file out of it, or you want to parse something, then you can use these methods to, to get hold of the actual bytes or the actual information about files or directories. Right, uh, results. So. Uh, a front end is aiming to produce a result, and this is the result structure. Results basically come in two kinds. You have ones which are singleton references. They just fill in this uh, ref member. Um, and the other type is uh, you have a, a, 
a collection of named references, uh, so a multi-ref result. And in both cases, you also have the opportunity to attach various bits of metadata. Um, so in the most simplest case, what you're trying to do is you're trying to just produce a single container with a single root file system and a single configuration. Uh, so in that case, as a front end, all you would do is you'd fill in the ref with a reference to the snapshot that you wanted to be the container's root. And you would fill in the metadata with this uh, well-known metadata key, container.image, into which you would put the uh, JSON encoded OCI spec configuration for that container. And then the exporters know about that key and they know to look in the ref and they would then produce an OCI image or a Docker image or, or whatever. Uh, so that's the simple case, that's uh, a fairly common case, but if you wanted to get more complicated and you want to produce, say, a multi-platform result, so you want the exporter to produce a manifest referencing several different images for several different platforms. That's a bit more complicated. Um, now we have this ref.platforms, which is another well-known key which indicates that this is going to multi-platform result. And what that contains is an array mapping platforms to arbitrary unique IDs. So here we have uh, one platform mapping to a, a unique identifier P1 and another platform mapping to a unique, unique identifier P2. And with those, the exporters know then to go and look in the multi-ref for uh, the P1 reference, and they know to look in, it's the same uh, well-known key, but with slash P1 on the end, and they know to look there for the OCI spec for that platform. Similarly for P2, and then so it'll, this will produce a, uh, a manifest with two platforms baked in, pointing to two separate images. Right, so we're gonna move on to the demo. Uh, feeling a distinct lack of grapes up here, but I'm sure we'll be fine. Um, so. We have some requirements. We need to build ourselves a custom front end. A front end has to be usable with Docker 1809. Um, the resulting container must print some uh, user supplied text supp supplied at build time. And also, we need to be on brand because we all know how important that is. So, let me see if I can. Oh, yeah. Right, so here we have a, uh, essentially an empty skeleton of a, a custom front end. Uh, we have our, our build entry point. It takes a gateway client RPC object that it can uh, call methods on, and it takes a result. Um, and that's, that's the basic interface that a front end needs to satisfy. So what we're gonna do, um, we're gonna build a, uh, a silly container that just prints uh, a whale, as we've seen earlier, with some custom text. And so we're gonna be using Cowsay. Um, now, there is a, a whale say uh, image on Hub it's very old, it's based on Ubuntu 14.04, it's quite big, it's single platform only, um, none of which is very useful to us, so instead we're gonna build it uh, directly as LLB, we're gonna construct our own base image, so as if by magic a function appears. Um, so we can see here some of the concepts that I've, uh, I've already been talking about. So here we have an LLB image starting from the Alpine base, um, and I'm requesting that it's of a particular platform, which has been uh, passed in to me. That's a fairly simple case. Here's a more interesting one. So Cowsay is written in Perl, so we need to install Perl. So we're gonna do a run. We're gonna tell it to run apk add Perl. And what we want out of that is essentially the root file system having installed apk. So we use the, the dot root at the end. And so we've now chained from an Alpine base image. And now we have a state which represents that Alpine base image upon which apk add has been run. Uh, so that's a, a simplish case. Um, if we look at the next, 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 uh, Next bit, we need to install Cowsay from somewhere. Uh, so Cowsay is a, available in a Git repository, so we uh, create ourselves a Git source. Um, and then starting from our state where we've installed Perl, we wanna do another run. We're gonna add the Cowsay source as a uh, as slash Cowsay, so that'll make that Git repository available as Cowsay. We're gonna make our current working directory that same directory, and then we're gonna run the install script that uh, Cowsay provides. Um, and again, having done that, what we want is the root that came out at the end. So now we have a state, still called ST, where we've chained together uh, an Alpine image, an APK install, and then the install process of this Cowsay program. Um, now a slightly more complicated version. So now we need to get the custom uh, Docker Whale uh, uh, artwork, shall we say, um, and the only place I could find that was in this existing old Ubuntu image. So. What we're gonna do is uh, we can use that image, which is only available on NB64, so we hard code that. Uh, we're gonna say we want to use that as whale say, uh, and then we're gonna use busybox, and we're gonna run this CP command. And this, this is gonna copy from slash source, use a local share cows, docker.cow, to slash dust, 
use the local share cows default.cow. Um, so that's going to run the copy. So we need the source mounted. So we mount our whale say as a source as one of the run arguments. But then here we're demonstrating for dust, we're demonstrating the other form of getting an output out of a run, which is where what we actually want is we want to take our state where we've installed uh, Perl and Cowsay. We want to mount that on dust. And then as a result, we want the, uh, the resulting state of that. We don't want this busy box with this CP command in it. That's, we just want that for its side effects. Uh, right, so that's a Cowsay. That produces us a, a, an LLB state, which is the, the base of our container images. Now we need to call it second time as if by magic. Uh, so we have our string that we want to print, hello world. We get, grab our state, uh, which is the, the thing that we've just built up. And then we have our OCI uh, image spec, where basically we just specify the architecture that we're going to be and the command we're going to run, which is just to run Cause A with whichever text we've been given. So finally, we call, we call that function. We've now, so now we've got a state and image in our hand. And we can call this uh, utility function which wraps up some of the complexity of actually calling the gateway solve. Um, we can dive into that a little bit. Basically, we're, we're marshalling up. We're creating the, the binary DAG out of those Go objects. We're tweaking our config a little bit. We're marshalling the config to JSON. And then we eventually call the solve, and that gives us a result. Um, and then actually, all we need to do is to attach our config to that result and return it. And then that will become the result of running our custom front end will then be passed to an exporter. So let's give that a run. Um, I have some scaffolding, uh, you know, CLI client things. So we're using build. Oops. So we build it, go build. Just so now we have a, a, a binary called build, which it, uh, embeds uh, the front end that we've just written. Uh, so if we run that, uh, wait for the Wi-Fi to do all of its DNS lookups. So everything's cached except for the DNS lookups. It's, uh, <laughs> There we are, and it's now produced us. Uh, what do I want to do? Demo latest. Hello world, fantastic. Um, so we're on brand. We've got that bit. We're not yet uh, printing user supplied uh, text. So to do that, what we're going to do is instead of hard coding this, we're going to use a local. And so here we say we're going to we want to have a local called context. Uh, and from it, we want the, this, the uh, file called hi.tuxt. And then we're going to read from that state this file. Uh, so if we have a quick look into this helper function, we can see it's doing the same Marshall. It's then solving it. We know because we only passed in a, a single LLB graph that it's going to be a singleton uh, result. And so there's this helper function that validates that and gives you back just the one ref that it contains. And then we have the read file. So that'll now read the bytes out of that file. Uh, so, and the, re the rest of everything remains the same. We, we read the, the bytes and then we construct the image. So if we now run this one, rebuild it, and then if we run it, it'll say, oh, I don't know, what's, what's this context? There's no hello, there's no hi.txt. So if I echo, uh, oh. hello mom, that's Catalan apparently, I don't know how true that is. Um, we shall see. And we're going to pass in the local directory as context. And so we can see right at the top here, it's grabbed hi.txt out of the local context. But what it, it, so it's, it's transferred 42 bytes. It hasn't transferred all of the you know, 10 megabytes of vendoring that's included here. And if we now run that one with any luck, it says a different word. Hooray. So that's two out of our three. Um, requirements met. So the, the third and final requirement was that we need to be compatible with Docker 1809. So up till now, we've been running directly BuildKit clients. Um, but luckily, uh, it's actually very simple to now construct a container image. Uh, so if we look at this, we have a simple main uh, that's been conveniently word wrapped for us. Um, but this is basically all boilerplate. The only thing that differs here is the function that you call. And that function that we call is exactly the same function that we've been using up till now. Uh, and similarly, the uh, Docker file we're going to use is basically a, a bog standard go build, build a static container. The only thing that's perhaps of a little interest here is that we're, we're using a, a custom, the, the custom experimental uh, Docker file builder so that we can use the uh, 
the cache stuff so that things don't overrun any more than necessary. So what we're going to do is we're going to build that Docker file. I'm going to tag it um, front end. And so now we're building a container with our front end in it with the, the scaffolding necessary uh, to actually run uh, Demon side as a custom syntax loaded front end. go, running the actual go build, it's all nice and cached, so it's fairly quick. So now we have that, we need to find a way to actually invoke that, and so, uh, what am I doing, there we are. And so what we have here is uh, basically a stub Docker file that contains no actual Docker file instructions, all it contains is this, uh, is this declaration saying please use the container called front end, uh, and that's it, so there's no, none of the usual Docker file stuff here, this is basically just a uh, you know, go off onto a, a different path, please, Docker file. So if I now, well, first of all, let's go uh, for another language. I'm not really multilingual, but I like to pretend. Um, and so we're running that demo Docker file. We're tagging it demo, and it's the current directory. So that's now calling out to the Docker engine. It's loaded that Docker file that I gave it. It's discovered the syntax directive. It's now resolving and using uh, the front end, uh, my mouse has stopped working. So it's used, used the front end that we've just built, and if we now run it, hurrah. So there, we have met all three of our uh, requirements. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted a, a very quick aside about Docker Assembles, the new tool that we announced yesterday. Thomas already mentioned it. Um, but I thought it's worth pointing out that it's using exactly the same tools and techniques I've just discussed. Um, so we have some very simple but very powerful building blocks that'll let you do, you know, essentially arbitrarily complex things. Same as the Docker file front ends, which is how I'm segueing into contributing features to Docker file front ends. Um, so the Docker file front end currently lives in the Moby build kit uh, tree on GitHub um, in this, uh, front-end Docker file subdirectory, and all of the experimental features, so the shush mounts and the, uh, the various you know, clever types of mounts are simply Im implemented as uh, Go level conditional compilation using the usual Go build tag stuff. There's a Docker file in there with a build arg build tags, which you can, um, so you can build it with any set of the, uh, the available experimental options. So here we have an example of building a front-end that uses the run mount and the shush uh, experimental options. So if you wanted to add your own, thing, you create your own build tag, you create a bunch of files with, you know, slash go, colon, build, and that tag, and uh, arrange for that conditional compilation. So lots of these, there's lots of popular proposals for extensions to the Docker file. Um, here docs includes, I won't go through the whole list. These are all now possible. They can all be done externally, or they can be done as uh, conditionally compiled experimental things in the, in the main uh, Docker file front end source code, which, you know, would be the recommended way, I think. And we really were looking for the community to help us implement some of these ones and you know scratch their itches, scratch their friends' itches, uh, so on and so forth. That's it. Um, we're a little bit over time, so I don't know that we're going to have time for questions, but we have a hallway track at 1 o'clock in 18 minutes down at the hallway track. Uh, don't bother to register. Just come down and find me and Tonis. Uh, uh, we can also be found on the Bilkit channel on the Docker community Slack. Um, all of the code for that demo I just showed will be made public very shortly. It was private so that uh, it could be used for the secrets uh, demo. Um, and last thing I just want to mention is, uh, since we're in Europe, we are looking for engineers in Cambridge and Paris to come and work on Docker app, Docker assemble, CNAB, all sorts of cool developer-facing tools. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much.